It's great to have you joining us on Radio Free Georgia's In Tune to Nature program. I'm host Carrie Freeman coming to you from Atlanta in February of 2023. Today, we're going to be talking about a new award-winning environmental justice documentary called The Smell of Money, about the stench of pig farming and why this dirty and polluting industry is devastating not just to the pigs, but also to the surrounding rural neighborhoods. The Smell of Money tells the story of one such neighbor, Elsie Herring, who fought back. A century after her grandfather claimed his freedom from slavery and the family land, Elsie Herring and her North Carolina community team up with a gutsy small town lawyer to take on the world's largest pork company to take them to court. An epic nine-year legal battle ensues, and the residents risk everything to reclaim their freedom to enjoy fresh air, clean water, and a life without the stench of manure. The film trailer and viewing schedule can be viewed at the website smellofmoneydoc, as in documentary, smellofmoneydoc.com. Here to tell us about it is the film's writer and producer, Jamie Berger. Let me tell you about her. Jamie is a writer and documentary filmmaker born and raised in North Carolina. Her writing has been featured in popular outlets like Vox, The Guardian, USA Today, and more. Throughout her career, she has used writing and visual storytelling to draw attention to issues ranging from environmental racism to the climate crisis to other injustices wrought against people, other animals, and the planet. Some of the other films she has written include Pandemic of Injustice, and Three Sisters Swamp, the oldest bald cypress forest on the planet. Welcome, Jamie. Thank you so much for having me, Carrie. I'm very excited to be here. Yeah, well, how did you get the idea for the Smell of Money documentary about pig factory farming in North Carolina, and and how did the film get started? Yeah, so as you as you mentioned, I was born and raised in North Carolina, and most people know, at least in the U.S., that uh, pork is is big in North Carolina. Barbecue, you know, is kind of a state staple, and I grew up eating that and and other pork products as well. And never really gave a second thought to where those products came from until I got to college and I was studying the environment and um, the impacts, particularly of animal agriculture, on the environment. And I wanted to do uh, my honors thesis on a, you know, an element of the agriculture industry that was local to my home state. So naturally picked the pork industry. And the more I dove into it, the more just struck and heartbroken I was by the depth of the industry's impacts, negative impacts, not only, as you mentioned, on animals, but also on the people who live near giant factory farms or concentrated animal feeding operations, as they're sometimes called, or CAFOs. Uh, And so I really, that experience of researching that issue in my home state is what turned me into an activist. And I, you know, went on to produce videos and ended up in partnership with my colleague, Sean Bannon doing video production uh, and he suggested we do a feature length film. And this is the topic that I tossed out initially thinking it's such a powerful story that needs to be told. And that was uh, almost exactly five years ago when we started our our filmmaking process. Wow. And what were some of the titles that you considered naming the film and why did you settle on the smell of money? That's a great question. The working title of the film was Beyond the Pines, because at least originally when factory farms were first constructed in North Carolina, they were often placed behind a row of pine trees in kind of a a sort of desperate attempt to keep them somewhat hidden. Like from the road, like when you're driving down the road, there's the pine trees and you can't see those Exactly. Long warehouses. Yeah. Yeah. That's not the case anymore. There's so many of them, particularly now in the past few years, a lot of poultry farms have sprung up and the industry is sort of done hiding itself in North Carolina. But originally that was that was kind of the intention. Um, so Beyond the Pines was the first title we had. And then we came across this phrase that the industry would often use to describe the stench that lingers in the air everywhere in Eastern North Carolina, which was that it was the smell of money. And this particularly came from the kind of father of modern industrialized pork farming, whose name is Wendell Murphy, who was 
a pork magnate and a state uh, senator and and representative in North Carolina, actually. And, you know, pe whenever people would complain about the smell, he would say, you know, oh, don't bother about that. That's the smell of money. So that really struck us. I think this movie, you know, is is really about the kind of the reckless pursuit of profit at right. all costs and corporate greed. So bringing in a tie to money and, and of course the smell, which is a really present kind of theme um, and driver of the story in the film made a lot of sense to us. And also that phrase is just sickening too, to me, just because also who's making money? Probably just mostly him, you know? So it's like, like exactly. oh, everybody else is supposed to smell this horrible stench. So a few people can make money. I mean, it's just right. like, that is just so tone deaf and ignorant mm -hmm. as well. And also just the idea that everybody thinks money is worth, like it trumps everything, you know, that it's worth all the side effects or something, right. all the negative, right. but that's not everybody's, um, you know, viewpoint. Now, can you tell us where there's a hot, particularly high concentration of pig factory farms in North Carolina and why they're in that area of Eastern, like are there Eastern North Carolina, are there some kind of cities around there so we could place it on a map in our heads? Yeah, the main county that has the highest density of uh, factory farms, of pork farms and now poultry farms, really out of anywhere in the United States and pot potentially in the world is Duplin County. And like you said, that's in the Eastern part of the state. And sometimes it kind of fluctuates with the neighboring county, Sampson County for that, that title of having the, the highest concentration of factory mm -hmm. farms. And then anyone who knows North Carolina knows, you know, we do have our big kind of tech hubs. We have our kind of blossoming urban centers like Raleigh and Charlotte and Asheville, which is, you know, which are all beautiful, wonderful places to live. And then we have much poorer rural parts of the state that are also beautiful, wonderful places to live, but have been the sites of many polluting industries development, not just factory farms, but also, you know, landfills. We have coal ash plants in, in uh. North Carolina and Eastern North Carolina, um, the wood pellet industry, and it's really no coincidence that these industries have located themselves in these poor parts of the state. It's not only because of the, the you know, expense of the land being cheaper, but also the fact that many of the residents in these areas are Black, Indigenous, or Latinx folks. And, you know, they have less political power to fight back. They have fewer means to be heard. They have been, you know, systemically oppressed over the course of past few centuries. Obviously we have a history yeah. of slavery in North Carolina and there's a real concrete pattern of these industries developing in areas that were, uh, you know, formerly highly populated with, with enslaved people. So, you know, I think it's, it's really no coincidence and it's, it's a phenomenon that um, you know, is often referred to as environmental racism. Exactly. And can you paint a picture for us uh, on the radio of what these uh, factory farms look like? I know there's also some pictures of them at the smell of money doc, um, dot com, but like in terms of people visualizing them. So most factory farms in Eastern North Carolina house tens of thousands of animals. Uh, particularly poultry farms, the largest hog farms have about eight to 10,000 or so animals on, on any one farm. And they're called concentrated animal feeding operations by the industry because there really is just such a high concentration of animals in a very small land area. So you'll see as you're driving through the eastern part of the state and you will smell, of course, the stench of these operations you'll see these long metal sheds, these long metal, often windowless barns. Barns kind of actually conjures this image of, you know, this like bucolic kind of red barn like a, on a farm. Right, but a it's, pretty Right, but it's, it's really not, not like that. that. They I would like call them almost warehouses. Like, right, too, warehouses. They're like long warehouses. Exactly. Yeah, they look like these long warehouses. 
And they're really scattered all throughout the state, all throughout the eastern part of the state. You really can't miss them if you drive through that area because there are just so many. And, and if you're looking on Google Maps too, exactly. like I do that too when I'm driving around even um, North Georgia, we, we have a lot of chicken farms and they have a similar shape to them, a long, thin building. Mm -hmm. So you can see them on like Google Earth and Google Maps too. Right, exactly. And with pork farms, with hog farms in North Carolina, the way that the waste is managed is that animals, you know, are kept inside these, these long metal warehouses and they live on top of slatted floors. So when they, when they, you know, defecate, when they, um, you know, when they pee, the, yeah. the waste from these animals falls through those, those slatted floors into a, um, kind of a holding tank that then is swept out into what the industry calls a lagoon. That kind of gives you, the, you know, you'll get the sense. That it's a not a blue lagoon. <laughs> right. There are a lot of euphemisms that the industry uses to kind of, um, you know, clean up, clean up the sound of its practices, would, but it's probably better called a cesspool. Exactly. It looks kind of like a brown lake, right? Like a little, but a rectangular lake, right. if you're looking on a map or whatever, but it's a cesspool. Exactly. And they can be several football fields in, in size. And yeah. it's, it's hard to describe just the, the, how massive these, these gigantic cesspools really are. And like you said, they're often, they often are tinged kind of brown or even pink because of the chemicals in them. So it's not just, you know, waste that's flowing into these, these open air pits, but also you know, antibiotics that are used on the farms, other, other drugs, there's heavy metals, there's all kinds of pollutants that find their way from the farms operations into these, these open air pits. And then what happens is once these pits fill up, and this is the part that so many people find just abhorrent and hard to believe, but once these pits fill up, what the industry does is takes the waste and pumps it out through these gigantic industrial sprayers. Imagine like a massive, you know, sprinkler, but just yeah. industrial sized, oh, super sized. And they shoot it out at a very high velocity over fields under the pretext of fertilizing crops. But really this is just a cheap waste disposal method for the industry. So They'll spray it out over crops. And, and of course, we know from a number of, of studies that this waste doesn't just stay on the land. It flows into rivers and streams nearby, and it actually drifts in the air and yeah. lands on nearby residents' homes and property. Ew. That's so gross. And it smells awful like when you drive by one of these places and I'm even just thinking in north in, in north Georgia with the chicken farms too you have to roll your windows up and you tr you're trying to get out of there because it just smells it just hits you it's it really disgusting. does it's absolutely revolting it's it's again so hard to describe how terrible it is I wish that's something we could have somehow included right, a scratch in and film. sniff documentary <laughs> yeah right. um but it it it's the the interesting thing about it, the particularly kind of pernicious part of it is that it doesn't just, it's not just like you get a, you know, a whiff of it and then it sort of moves on. It hangs in the air. Mm. It really does. And it embeds itself in your clothes, mm. in your hair. It's, it's impossible to escape it. A brief anecdote I like to mention about the smell is that there's a researcher who was doing, you know, some some analysis of pollution in the area and spent some time in that area and then went home, you know, back to where he lived out, outside of that part of the state. And the smell followed him and he couldn't figure out where it was coming from. He washed all his clothes. He took lots of showers. It was even a couple of months after he had been doing that research and he was still smelling it. And he realized it had actually embedded itself in his metal eyeglasses. Oh, that's how powerful that's so weird. this stench is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we, okay. So we know that the tens of thousands of intelligent, sensitive pigs are suffering greatly inside these animal agribusiness warehouses, but what are some of the problems these pig factories are also causing for the human residents and the surrounding wildlife? And I can mm -hmm. imagine the, the stench is part of it because they're stuck there. They can't escape. 
Yeah, I'd love to address that last part before kind of of oh, the wildlife question part. more broadly. Yeah. Well, no, the fact that that folks are stuck there. We often yes. hear this question of, you know, why don't they just move if the smell is so bad and they're being impacted so terribly by this? Why don't they just move? And I think that question really mm. overlooks again the legacies of slavery and oppression that have been part of the you know historical context in this in this area of the state. Not it does, also doesn't recognize the fact that you know what is your property worth if you're next to yeah. one of these facilities? Almost right. nothing. It just ruined their property value that exactly. their family worked so hard to be landowners, and then this industry comes along and ruins it. Exactly, and this land for so many of the folks we interviewed for our subjects of the film. It's been in their family for generations. It's it a source has, of pride. Exactly. It has so much meaning to them. So to say, oh, why don't you just pick up and move is, you know, is, is really overlooking a lot of a lot of factors, very important factors that keep people tied to that place, whether they want to be or not. And in most cases, they do want to be, you know, it's their home. They don't want to leave. But some of the impacts that they, you know, that they experience, and these have been well documented since since, you know, the 1990s even, are just severe effects on their physical health. So in areas with high concentrations of of factory farms, in comparison to other other areas of even North Carolina, there are higher rates of different kinds of cancers, of respiratory illnesses, of infections. There are... um, higher infant mortality rates, higher, you know, mortal, all cause mortality rates. And these are controlling for, you know, other factors that might affect these folks in these region, in this region. Um, but there's also, like you said, just the, the kind of indignity and just the, just the, you know, stress and anxiety that is caused by living within an area that is polluted, that smells horrible, where you it means you don't matter. Nobody cared about you. Right. And where your you can't family just, and your community. Right. Where you can't just enjoy kind of the simple pleasures that so many of us sitting on your granted. porch and watching right, your kids your play porch. in the yard. Exactly. Watching your kids play, you know, having a party in your yard. And these yeah. are especially, you know, a, a big deal in in the South in North Carolina. Yeah. And these are the kind of the kind of activities that keep communities tied together. So to, you know, to have all of that wiped away by this industry has a deeply harmful effect on people living there. Um, you know, not just physically, but also emotionally, and you know, in terms of their mental health as well. Yeah. If you're just joining us on Radio Free Georgia, this is In Tune to Nature. I'm host Carrie Freeman talking about this award-winning environmental justice documentary, The Smell of Money, with the film's writer and producer, Jamie Berger. The trailer and a list of the awards and film festival schedule are at the website, thesmellofmoneydoc.com. Um, with the few minutes we have left, um, I noticed that the film website and trailer mentioned the intimidation of Black residents who live near the pork industry factory farms. And we also saw a glimpse of a Confederate flag. Uh, what was happening? And I guess that some of that might be caught up in the fact that they're trying to fight back or defend themselves, but some maybe some intimidation was happening by the, the corporate entity or maybe some local people, I wasn't sure. We heard over and over again when we were in that region of North Carolina, when we were interviewing our subjects, this comparison of the pork industry kind of being like the mafia there. Mm. The fear of this industry is so palpable. They are so powerful and they've done so much to silence residents who would speak out about pollution. Elsie Herring, our, our primary subject, she faced just endless intimidation from her neighbor who was a pork farmer. He came over to her property with a gun. Uh. He uh, assaulted her elderly mother who was in her late nineties at the time or early nineties at the time in her nineties, oh um, you know, through all kinds of terrible language, racial slurs at her. And, and we heard this over and over and over again from advocates who who live in that area, who are fighting, you know, 
for their basic right to breathe clean air and drink clean water that they were intimidated not only by the farmers themselves sometimes, but also by the industry and even by, you know, just neighbors. I think one of the, the most horrible things about this is that it, it can drive a wedge in these communities. Um, and I think the, the other kind of element to mention is that law enforcement we heard so many times is almost always on the side of the industry, you know? So yeah. it's like when you're dealing with harassment, when you're dealing with intimidation or even just the smell itself or the disruption to your daily life and you want to call the folks who are supposedly there to protect you, you know, they show up and, and they're on your enemy's side. And we experienced that pretty directly as those who watch the film will see. I don't want to give too much away about that, but yeah, and, and it's, you know, impossible to talk about this without mentioning the fact that so much of this is racially motivated, that there is, again, this history in this region, and not just history, but modern day, you know, racism that that is, is palpable still in Eastern North Carolina. And um, I know I'm going to be wrapping up, but I wanted to just mention that though the film also shows people there is like a triumph in the act actual um seeing people though fight back so even though we're talking about all the negative things i know in the documentary there's like a lot of characters that people will meet and um and there's like a sense of a kind of fighting for a community so there's that kind of spirit there um that i think people will enjoy um is the film website the best place for people to find out the latest information on where the smell of money would be airing Yes, the website is a great place to stay on top of where you can see the film. Uh, we also have a Twitter and Instagram where you can follow us. Uh, the handle for those is similar to the website, Smell of Money Doc. And we post updates regularly on, on Instagram, especially about where the film is screening and, and how folks can check it out. And just as the, a last quick question for listeners who are interested in stopping factory farming from devastating more communities, is there anything that people could do? Well, this is a big question. There's a lot that folks can do. I think, you know, we can, of course, take a look at our own eating practices and think about the products that we purchase and what happens to the folks who live, <clears throat> excuse me, who live, you know, downstream of our own food choices. I think there's so much we can do to get politically active uh, right. against these, these issues. We can contact our legislators and you know, urge them to represent the citizens you know, who they have been entrusted to, to work for. Um, I think that's a big, a big element that we need folks who, even those who don't live in these areas to be willing to, you know, to call on their elected officials to, to address these issues. And I also think, you know, there are more systemic solutions like helping farmers transition out of industrial animal agriculture. I know we didn't get to speak to this too much, but, you know, farmers are often trapped in this system as well. And a lot of them do want to get out. So I think helping, giving them the tools and resources to transition out of it into something more sustainable, like plant agriculture, like growing mushrooms, for example, is another great solution. I also just want to mention, you know, we worked in over the course of creating this film with some amazing advocates and yeah. organizations. And, you know, um, for, in North Carolina, there are a number of, of ones that we've, we've highlighted on our website, but I would urge listeners also to just look up who the, you know, who the organizations are, who the advocates are in your area who are fighting environmental racism, whether it's, you know, related to animal agriculture or other industries that are harmful. That's great. And I would say Food and Water Watch is another organization, I think, that works on this issue. And then I think the River Keeper probably was one of the um, groups, I think, in your Yes, film too, and a lot of different alliance. communities have their own river keeper organizations for the rivers in your area. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. So that's, that's awesome. Well, that's the end of our show, but I want to thank you, Jamie Berger, for being with us on Radio Free Georgia's In Tune to Nature program. And thanks for the many years of work you did documenting the heroism and triumph of these rural residents of North Carolina standing up 
to the dirty animal agribusiness industry. Thank you so much for having me, Carrie. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. And to our listeners, thank you for tuning in to In Tune to Nature, broadcasting every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time, online at wrfg.org and on Atlanta radio station 89.3 FM. We post action items, news, and podcasts on the show's website, facebook.com slash to nature. The views and opinions expressed on this show do not necessarily reflect those of WRFG, its board, staff, or volunteers. I'm one of those volunteers. I'm host Carrie Freeman asking you to please support independent, non-commercial media like Radio Free Georgia. And remember to take care of yourself and others, including other species. Thank you for listening. Cheers.